I think if we summarized our story, it's a story of two people that were broken. Even if I told you all the details of what happened between her and myself and her and my uh, some family members, none of it would ever excuse or explain the way that I acted. It's a story about faith, love, a lot of laughter, and it's a story that no matter how far you run, Jesus is always coming after you, and you are never too far gone. I'll never get that time back. And I, I robbed my wife of so many moments that she and I should have had. I did a lot of plays in the school and one of four kids. It's you, getting your voice out there is really tough, actually, um, especially in my family, because <laughs> we are loud and opinionated. And uh, stepping into a spotlight was something I was really comfortable with. My grades weren't very good, but I was like the extracurricular king uh, and all of it creative and kind of showy in nature. I was very much the party guy. I showed up, made a bunch of people laugh, you know, would pull my shirt off while lip syncing to Journeys Don't Stop Believing. Like it was, it was always a performance. And uh, while some people laughed along and thought, oh, this guy's funny, this guy's great. Uh, there were also people that were very concerned for me, like, dude, you're it's just too much. Like, chill out. We don't like this energy. Come to find out I didn't like that energy either. It just took me a while to figure that out. I think being the funny kid in the family of, of the four of, of us siblings was a blessing that kind of turned into a curse because then that became my identity. I'm not classically... Uh, attractive by the world standards, and I'm not especially smart by the book's standards, and I'm not a great athlete, so what? what is my thing? Well, I'll contribute to the world uh, creatively, and I'll be the funny, uh, the funny big guy. Between the ages of like 16 and 21, in those five years, I put on 100 pounds from about 2.30 to 3.30. That's a lot of weight. That's a, that's a human to put on in five years. It very much was a product of eating fast food, getting stoned, drinking alcohol, not exercising. It was just like, it was bad. I tried taking on the identity of other people that I deemed like me, uh, Chris Farley, John Belushi, eventually Philip Seymour Hoffman. What I would later come to realize was that all, all those guys are dead. The common denominator is not just that they're talented, the common denominator is that they're all very depressed and, and addicted and, um, and died way too young. I grew up in the church and believing in God and having a relationship with Jesus. My dad's a Lutheran pastor. My mom worked in churches and schools. You know, I, I read the book, I did the stuff, I sang the songs. What's different though is when you're a little kid, I don't know that there's a maturation right away with your relationship to God because you, you're you kind of doing what you see done. I always looked at people like the band uh, Switchfoot or uh, a guy like Stephen Colbert, where they're, they're people of faith, they believe in Jesus, but they're also uh, doing something creative that was put upon them as a calling. And I, I felt like that was my calling, was to still be a 
person of faith, but be doing something different than the rest of my family. I got into stand-up and screenwriting and dramatic acting in my late teens, early 20s, and eventually got represented by a Hollywood management company and agency and moved to Los Angeles. And uh, I started in comedy and had hoped that I'd get to do drama someday because it just was something I enjoyed watching and, and trying to do. And that's exactly what happened. My first movie I did was in Michigan, and I, I think I made after expenditures while shooting, I probably made about $8,500. So I'm moving to LA, this kid from the Midwest who, you know, I'm 23 years old with eight grand and a movie credit with a bunch of Oscar winners. And I was super dumb. There was a lot of arrogance that I didn't know I had, you know. I drank in, in excess. I ate to excess at the time. And I just, you know, it consumed so much of everything. And then marijuana became this thing that I was like proudly involved with. And I think that was also me like trying to be like, look at me, I'm the cool Christian. I party hard, but I'm still in church on Sunday or whatever. I grew up in a small town in South Georgia called Thomasville, Georgia, right above Tallahassee, Florida. The oldest of three girls. My dad was a teacher and my mom was in the medical field. Um, we grew up in the church. I wasn't wild and crazy in high school. I danced a lot. That was my main thing in theater. And so that always kept me really busy. And then I was involved in my church. Like I would lead um, Bible studies in high school for certain clubs that we had. And I had a pretty solid relationship with Jesus then. I went to college and almost towards the end of college, I started dating a guy. We dated for about a year and then um, we ended up getting married. Well, within the first couple months, I started feeling signs of abuse. And then eventually it ended up with him pointing a gun at me and looking at me, seeing my face, knowing that I was scared. And he looked at me and he said, don't worry, I won't shoot you. You'd be a waste of a good bullet. That was a really hard moment for me because I remember thinking, he's right. And my self-worth was so diminished. All the things that I knew to be true of Jesus, like I had forgotten. And during that time, um, we drank a lot and would have these big parties at our house. And everybody knew that we were the fun couple, but behind closed doors, it was really bad. One day, I just was like, I can't do this anymore. And so I divorced him. And someone told me in the church, well, God's not ever gonna wanna use you again now that you're divorced. And I remember just saying, okay, well, fine. I'll just go and drink. So I ended up moving down to Tallahassee. There's still this like urge, like draw to Jesus. Like I still want to work with the youth group. So I did that and became friends with the youth pastor there. And he knew the double life that I was living. And one day he said to me, Amy, how can you be doing all this here at church? And you know the impact that you're having. And then you go home and throw these parties. And I was like, you don't know me. You don't know my story. And he said, you're right, I don't know you. But what I do know is that the old is gone and the new has come. In that, I ended up rededicating my life to Jesus. And so I threw myself into ministry. I started working with an alcohol and drug rehab. I quit drinking. And I had this just fire in my bones to tell people about Jesus, to tell them how loved they were. I also found that I love to organize events. So I started helping with promotions for tours and concerts, and that led me to working with Chris Tomlin and the Passion Band. And then a friend of mine was doing movies in LA, and he was like, hey, I think you'd be a really great producer. So in 2019, I went and helped produce my first movie, and I just fell in love with it. So the summer before I'm about to go help produce this movie, I'm on a dating app. I booked a Clint Eastwood movie in Atlanta, Georgia, 
based on a true story. It was called Richard Jewell. And while I'm there, I'm on a couple different dating apps, very unsuccessful. <laughs> and while I'm in Atlanta, I come to find out Amy Boland is also in Atlanta. And there's this guy on there and he says, I want to meet someone that likes to go out and have fun, but also likes to stay home for 30 hours. And I was like, that is me. 